to me, she seems to have been a character full of humor and um, her fabrics are touching and inspiring when you look at them. They are absolutely minimal and reduced, but elegant and fresh, never strict or boring. They are always <laughs> really taking you in somehow, which was for me absolutely seducing and, and the reason for spending several years studying her fabrics. My name is Judith Raum. I am a visual artist based in Berlin. My main focus uh, during the last couple of years was on Otti Berger's textile work. My name is Anja Guttenberger and this is my podcast, Bauhaus Faces. <laughs> Welcome to a new episode of Bauhaus Faces. This time we will hear textile researcher and artist Judith Raum talk about the Hungarian Bauhaus weaver Otti Berger. Otti's story is one full of happiness, life, ambition, talent and a prosperous future. There were so many things for her in the cards. Otti was a beautiful woman, nearly deaf because of a mistreatment of her ears when she was a child, but very much liked at the Bauhaus by students and masters. Her work in the weaving workshop at the Bauhaus inspired her to upgrade the idea of simple decorative weaving to functional textiles. After completing her studies, she taught at the Bauhaus and opened her own Atelier für Stoffe textile studio in Berlin at Fasanenstraße 13. Today, a so-called stumbling stone, Stolperstein, commemorates Otti here. Otti Berger really excelled in creating new fabrics for buildings, trains and airplanes and was the only Bauhaus weaver who had her fabrics patentized. As a Jew, she prepared to emigrate to the US and had tried to settle in England. Due to a lack of jobs in England and an ailing mother, she returned to her family in Hungary, now Croatia. Although Leslie Moholy Nodge invited her to come and teach at the new Bauhaus in Chicago, she was not granted a visa to go to the US. Her life ended tragically and abruptly when she was deported to the concentration camp Auschwitz on 29th of May 1944 with most of her siblings and was murdered there shortly after. What's left are some letters and postcards, patents for some of her original textiles, published texts and fabric samples in archives around the world, preserved by Otti's friends in England. In this podcast episode, Judith Raum tells us all about Otti Berger's life, her work as a weaver, as a businesswoman and as a teacher. Otti Berger was uh, not German. She was born in a part of nowadays Croatia that was at the time of her birth uh, still part of Hungary. It's called Baranja, a region really at the borderline between Croatia, Hungary and Serbia um, and close to the Danube River. Uh, the small village or little town th that she grew up in uh, is called Smajevac. The Hungarian name is Vörösmart. It was a region that ethnic identity constantly sh shifted. That's, all, that's why also the name of the village uh, often changed. And her father was a tradesman. He owned a shop and was trading with all kinds of goods there. She had some education uh, first in Zagreb and later in Vienna, where she also learned fluent German and came to the Bauhaus Dessau in 1927 to begin to study there in the four course with Moholy Nash and entered uh, the textile workshop half a year later. And from that year onwards, so from the fall of 1927 until 1930, she was part uh, of the student body at the Bauhaus Dessau, did an uh, exchange semester or semester abroad in Sweden for some time, but spent the rest of the time in Dessau, uh, became a very... Uh, highly acknowledged and appreciated student and co-worker in the textile workshop and did her diploma in the fall of 1930, then worked in some uh, industrial uh, companies for some time in Saxony and close to Breslau and came back to the Bauhaus Dessau to teach for some time. That was in 1931 and 1932. She filled in for Gunther Stölzl, who had to leave for political reasons, 
Herr Gunter Stölzel had led the textile workshop for a couple of years. Otti Berger filled in for her until Lili Reich, who was appointed by Mies van der Rohe in 1932 uh, at the beginning of the year, joined the school staff. So Otti Berger gave place for Lili Reich and then left for Berlin in the fall of 1932 uh, to open up her own studio for textiles. I have no information about the reasons for her going to the Bauhaus Dessau. There's very little sources um, from that time of her life. Um, no letters survived saying why she opted uh, for that school and who told her about it. We only found a photograph, or I found it now, the inscription of on this photograph. that uh, That's a photograph that's kept in the collection of the Bauhaus Archive in Berlin. And that shows Odi Berger already in the spring of 19. Uh, 27, as far as I remember correctly now, at a, at a birthday party at the Bauhaus Dessau, but uh, her actual enrollment was in the fall. So, or maybe I'm making it up now. <laughs> I'm confusing something. And it is uh, it is even uh, the inscription even dates uh, fall 26. In any case, the inscription indicates that Otti Berger already frequented the Bauhaus or uh, spent time there. Uh, as a visitor, before she was even enrolled, which is, of course, not surprising. Everybody knows that when you are interested in a school, you might already go there, look for contacts with uh, students and uh, yeah, try to collect information about the place. So she was obviously present at some birthday party while she was not even a, a proper student yet. Um, she had come to Germany, that's what we know, because uh, she had a hearing impairment, Uh, that resulted from a wrong uh, treatment of her ears at an early age during her childhood. And she was in Germany for medical treatment of her ears during the year of 1926. So it's probable that she heard, yeah, speaking about the Bauhaus then while she was in Germany. There are two quite well-known projects. One is uh, for the Bundesschule in Bernau by Hannes Meyer and Hans Witwer, for which the textile workshop was very active anyways and produced a couple of uh, textile pieces. Um, Otti Berger uh, handed in a proposal for a blanket, a day cover blanket for the beds of the student apartments, and uh, it was accepted by the jury and was produced in high numbers uh, to become the standard equipment of the student apartments. It was a blanket made of artificial silk yarns. We unfortunately have no original preserved, at least no known original maybe <laughs> in the future, bits and pieces of one fabric might appear. But we know the fabric, uh, I, I was able to identify it in photographs and really pin down the structure, the weave structure of the fabric. It was a kind of fishbone structure already quite typical for, for the style or the techniques in which Otti Berger preferred to work. She would usually do monochrome fabrics that uh, were vital and interesting because of their structure, because of the use of yarns and the choice of weave construction that she opted for and that creates a certain repetitive movement or repetitive pattern on the surface of the fabric. And in the case of that blanket, it was a, it was a regular lines in two different diagonal directions, like a fishbone structure. And another important piece uh, that's quite famous and has been illustrated a couple of times that she did during her time at the Bauhaus was a, a rug uh, called a rug for a, a children's room. It's a quite colorful piece. It was a flat tapestry, a kalim-like rug with uh, colorful squares. And I also found documents that prove that she did at least two, if not even three, copies of that same rug. So that rug was obviously also meant uh, to be produced in higher numbers. It was not a unique piece. It, it uh, carried the tag, the Bauhaus tag, made of aluminium, Bauhaus Dessau. And um, it's also visible on one photograph that's part of the collection um, of Hilbersheimer's estate at the Ryerson and Burnham archives in at the Art Institute of Chicago, a black and white photograph that shows uh, Otti Berger's private apartment in Berlin when she had moved to Berlin to become a self-employed textile designer. Uh, the bedroom with a table and a chair had this rug on the floor. So she obviously 
kept one copy for, to herself and, and used it in her private spaces. What we know is that she was friends with Marcel Breuer, who was, uh, of course, uh, also of Hungarian origin. Probably they spoke the same language and felt close. Uh, she was also good friends with Gunther Störsel at her time at the Bauhaus Dessau. They exchanged postcards. It's not clear if that friendship kept uh, on after both women left the Bauhaus. There's little uh, correspondence um, that survived. Oskar Schlemmer was also a closer friend. There's some correspondence that survived between the two of them, even after they both uh, left the Bauhaus. There's Margarete Darmbeck, uh, who she was very close to. She left when she left Berlin for her uh, exile in Great Britain in England a couple of years later. She left her Meissner porcelain with Margarete Darmbeck, actually, and that uh, porcelain has survived in the family until today. Who else? We also have documents on a close connection between Gertrude Arndt and Otti Berger because there's a couple of photographs that Gertrude Arndt took of Otti Berger in disguise. Otti Berger loved to put costumes on. She had a couple of original, traditional folk costumes from her own home region with her in suitcases, and she would love to put them on, not only for festive occasions at the Bauhaus, but only just for fun. And um, Gertrude Arndt uh, took a couple of portraits of Otti Berger in these uh, kind of clothes. And there's also a series of portraits that Lucia Moholy took of Otti Berger, which is maybe, which are the most beautiful portraits ever taken of Otti Berger in profile, in, in a frontal perspective, a close ups and from, an, from different distances, very intense and um, interesting perspectives on that beautiful woman that she was um, that don't highlight uh, her beauty so much, but rather show her as a, professional, also sensitive, and uh, yeah, as a thinking person. That's also what, what touched me when I saw these photographs first. And um, you see her really as, a, as an intellectual somehow in these, in these photographs. Ludwig Hilversheimer and Otti Berger started a relationship, a personal uh, intimate relationship, quite soon after he had uh, arrived at the Bauhaus Dessau, Let me just give you some quick biographical facts about Ludwig Hilbersheimer. He was a German architect and urban planner and one of the founding members of The Ring, together with Hugo Hering and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. The Ring was an architectural organization. Hilbersheimer was appointed to the Bauhaus in Dessau by the second Bauhaus director, Hannes Meyer, in 1929, where he taught building and planning. He developed a decentralized organization of large cities and also a global adaptable planning system which envisioned a gradual dissolution of major cities and a complete penetration of landscape and settlement. When Mies van der Rohe became director in 1930, Hilbus Eimer stayed at the Bauhaus and taught urban planning and housing development. Hilbus Eimer emigrated to the US in 1938 to work with Mies van der Rohe at the Armour Institute of Technology, later Illinois Institute of Technology, IIT, in Chicago, to teach again urban and regional planning. The impression that we get from the documents is that Ludwig Hilbersheimer was very discreet and kept things uh, very discreet. Otti Berger and he had an intimate relationship beginning in 1932, that's for sure, maybe even earlier. And we have proved that uh, they were exchanging on all kinds of uh, levels. When Otti Berger moved to Berlin and opened her own studio, he would be in uh, intense exchange with her on all kinds of professional and administrative matters uh, concerning the organization, the, the juridical organization of her business. Um, meaning he supported her in the writing of the theoretical text she, she wrote at times for magazines or journals. Um, there, there are uh, handwritten notes in his handwriting in her manuscripts. He also supported her in the negotiations on her patents. So we have his handwritten corrections in all kinds of correspondences that she had with her patent attorney on juridical issues concerning the copyright of her fabrics. And from these uh, 
details in the documents, hidden in the documents between the lines, we can conclude that they must have been there must have been a great exchange between the two of them, also on the professional side. For the personal side, we have a couple of postcards that Otto Berger kept writing to Ludwig Hilbersheimer, and we have a couple of letters that the couple sent back and forth between them. But yeah, there's really not much information on that relationship. There's only one photograph that shows the two of them in one image. So it seems that yeah, the, the effort on Ludwig Hilversheimer's side after Otti Berger's death to keep that relationship in some way discreet is very obvious. We also have information that he asked people who took care of Otti Berger's estate after her death, who took care of the things that she left behind in London in her English exile. Ludwig Hilversheimer asked, to, uh, asked for his letters to be destroyed. So it's not easy to reconstruct uh, all elements of that partnership and relationship, but uh, for sure they were a couple. There is an early letter just uh, at the threshold of ending her studies at the Bauhaus Dessau and moving on into the new future as, an, uh, as a self-employed woman, where she was still trying to find her way and where she writes to Adolf Loos in Vienna, asking him for advice where she should go, uh, which uh, textile studio she should apply at, and confessing that how much she admired his work and his uh, thinking and that she had been following all his texts. And there's also a theoretical text by her where she refers to Loos and his abolition of the ornament um, so that kind of discourse seems to have been a great moment of orientation for her. She is anyway strongly influenced by the discourse around the Neues Bauen. That was definitely also something that uh, fed in through her relationship with Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who was also an active thinker and writer in his field of urban planning and architecture. And in a later letter about her years, uh, mid-1930s in Berlin, Berger, for example, writes to Oskar Schlemmer, I think that is, that hardly any friendship between her ba former Bauhaus friends has survived. All of them were no real friends. She, she writes bitterly, it seems. The only persons, uh, the, the only people she is talking to are Ludwig Hilbersheimer and Hugo Herring. Hugo Herring, also an influential architect in the scene of the Neues Bauen. So she was strongly oriented towards um, architecture and the uh, accompanying discourses. But yes, she was in contact with Annie Albers during her time at the Bauhaus Dessau. We know that they were friends as well, that uh, Otti Berger sometimes came and saw Annie Albers uh, at her private home, at her parents' house in Berlin, that they discussed historical fabrics together, also went to museums. Uh, that's what Annie Albers describes in her memoirs in an interview. And Otti Berger gave a personal present to Annie Albers that survived until nowadays. It's a historical uh, jacket um, embroidered with colorful flowers. Uh, it's a folk costume from her home region, from, from the Baranja region. And the jacket survived in the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation in Bethany and was uh, for a long time not identified and um, I could now prove that it's actually a jacket given by Otti Berger to, to Annie Albers. The Gropiuses were also strong figures in Otti Berger's life. There's uh, proof that she was in constant exchange both with Ise and Walter Gropius. She also gave such a jacket to Ise. We know that from a letter that uh, Ise Gropius uh, sent to uh, Marcel Breuer at some point. Um, saying she was just wearing a pyjama jacket embroidered with flowers by Otti Berger. Uh, Walter Gropius and Ise Gropius would support Otti Berger throughout her lifetime, during her time in England, and even trying to help while already being in America. We know from the documents that she left behind, she, she left some teaching notes behind, that she put a great focus on the actual situation in the weaving mills at the time. She came into that teaching position um, with, with the background of a half a year of experience in, in modern weaving companies at, with industrial producers. And she was really determined to change the textile workshop's uh, core philosophy and target and influence the students in a way that they think 
of the conditions in which a modern textile producer works, that they know the machines, that they know the, um, yeah, the economic hardships, the speed of the production processes, the questions of pricing, of, um, of the costs of uh, uh, material and labor, and under these conditions, design the best possible fabric. And um, that means that she would, on the one hand, motivate them to experiment as much as they could, get a feeling for the fabric, for the material, for the yarn, different yarn qualities, different weave constructions. But on the other hand, really understand the logics of the industrial production process and obey to them in some way. So uh, try to push the creative possibilities as far as possible, but also be very realistic about modern means of production. And I think that was a quite new impulse because that was not um, ultimately performed under Gunther Stölzel, it seems to me, that strong orientation towards industrial production. Well, definitely, she she is really the one figure among the alumni of the textile workshop at the Bauhaus that stresses the connection to architecture strongly. Um, she does not want to produce unique pieces. She's not at all interested in weaving wall hangings or unique rugs. Her focus is on the development of uh, fabrics for the application in interior spaces that have an influence on architectural properties. And her focus is on producing fabrics that have an effect at moments where architecture was not able to be effective at the time. And Otti Berger was very clear in her writings that she said, the moment that architecture will be able to take over these functions, we can also get rid of these textiles. These fabrics are only made for these functional purposes. She was very explicit in that kind of sense. So it was a purely functional interest that she had. And correspondingly, um, the fabrics that she created were very thought through as far as their weave construction was concerned and as far as the choice of uh, the yarns was concerned. Because only through a proper choice of yarns and a proper choice of the weave construction, you can end up with a fabric that fulfills a certain function. So let's think about a wall fabric. Wall fabrics were still very common at the time. Uh, she was designing wall fabrics not only for the application in interior spaces like cinemas or theaters where they would have an effect on the acoustic influence, the acoustic situation in the room, but also, of course, the aesthetic appearance, the um, kind of glimmer and shine that would appear on a, uh, let's say, shiny fabric when the light is slowly switched on or slowly dims down. These fabrics also had an acoustic influence because they were double weaves in most of the cases, so very thick fabrics that would swallow sound. They were also hygienic because they were made of ribbon material uh, from a plant-based procedure uh, that were highly uh, robust and could be washed off if you wash them with uh, wipe them with a, a wet cloth. But she did not only design these wall fabrics, for example, for interiors. She also designed them for the interior of cabins of airplanes or of trains. So there was a, she had a clear focus. What is needed in the time that I'm living in? Modern means of transportation were exploding. There was more and more air travel uh, for yeah, regular air travel for passengers, not only for, <laughs> for, for uh, warplanes. And yeah, the passenger cabins needed to be equipped. So she proposed the fabrics for that. Another issue were uh, flooring materials, carpeting materials. She was, uh, so there was a, a during the Neues Bauen movement, of course, uh, old construction, former construction principles had been abolished and there were all kinds of new floorings. A lot of cement was used, creating cold feet not being very soft when stepping on. So she was trying to bring in certain carpeting, thin carpeting materials, again, double weaves with a woolen uh, reverse side and a very uh, robust front side that would take care of a, or offer a soft step, also insulate sound, 
but also give a warm, warming feeling to the feet. Aspects like that. I, I would also like to stress that she uh, was really insisting on the inventive step, the inventive quality of her developments and would the, the wall coverings, the floor coverings, and also the furniture coverings were all fabrics that she asked uh, patents for because they the constructive uh, invention in them was really so new that she thought it's important to have a, a copyright protection for these inventions. During the time uh, that Otti Berger was still a student at the Bauhaus in 1930, it was already a common practice or it began to, to become a common practice at the Bauhaus to ask for patents for certain inventions. There were patents for lamps. There were also patents for typography. But Otti Berger was the first and only one to ask for patents for textile inventions. And she remained the only one which is really striking, I think. And it is wonderful to, to read those files, the, those correspondences on her patent negotiations. We also can really be glad that we are able, that we are in the position to read through those correspondences because Ludwig Hilbersheimer, after her death, thought these should be destroyed. These might not be of uh, future interest. And the friends, uh, Otti Berger's friends in London uh, decided on their own will Ludwig Kilbersheimer had left it to them, this decision, to keep these documents. And we can nowadays uh, see them. They are stored at the Bauhaus Archive in Berlin. And mm -hmm. these documents prove that it was the no negotiation process, processes to get the patents through, which she not always succeeded in. Some patents were also denied. Um, these processes were very hard. And it's not clear if she was maybe... Yeah, we are maybe talking about a time where it was simply not common enough, not yet common enough to ask for patents for textile inventions so that uh, the, the kind of arguments uh, that people use, the patent examiner and the designer herself, are on the same level. Sometimes you get the impression that they maybe did not quite understand the, the point of her invention and neglected it for reasons that sound very bureaucratic. But yeah, this is uh, uh, for future research. It seemed to me that there's maybe a strange uh, fusion of, you know, the old hierarchies between the arts and, and the creative disciplines and the general neglection of the textile medium. When reading these correspondences, I was never sure, is she really, is her, is her accomplishment really acknowledged or is she misunderstood, or is it mm. also uh, is also the the accomplishment of a female designer misunderstood here? Um, th there's a strange fusion of of things, it seems. But yeah, she got some patents through. She also got some patents through in uh, one patent in England, uh, one patent that was neglected in in Germany that was refused in Germany. Uh, she ultimately obtained in England, so she had some success with these applications. She was both uh, actively writing on her medium. The first of her texts that was published uh, was uh, Stoffe im Raum, Fabrics in Space, in 1930 in the Czechoslovakia-based magazine um, Red, R-E-D. And so that remained a, a, a practice uh, for her, the writing on her medium. Although we know that she had a hard time writing those texts, she... Uh, she complains in several private letters how hard it is for her to, to find good and fluent words um, mm -hmm. to express her thoughts. And yes, I, I guess that she, she looked at, uh, at the general practice at the Bauhaus Dessa. We also know that uh, we, we, as far as the patent application processes is, are concerned, we also know that uh, during her years as a self-employed designer in Berlin, Mies van der Rohe was still in contact with Ludwig Hilbersheimer, of course. They were part of the same architectural circles and regularly met. And Otti Berger must have met him once too. And the patent issues must have been part of the discussion between the two of them. Uh, because in a letter, she reports that uh, Mies van der Rohe had pointed out to her that there is the possibility to ask for patents also in England. So, yeah, they were obviously exchanging as colleagues about possible ways of getting their things patented. Let me give you just two examples of Otti Berger's patents. 
her first patent she obtained for an upholstery fabric made of artificial horsehair. She developed this fabric while teaching at the Bauhaus in 1932. In her free time, she experimented with materials, among others with artificial horsehair, to produce robust upholstery fabrics. In June of 1932, her attorney, Hans Heimann, applied in her name for patent protection of the so-called Möbelstoff Doppelgewebe, in English upholstery fabric double weave, with the German patent office. Some corrections and technical descriptions needed to be added until the patent was accepted in February of 1934. The patent defined the weave as a new upholstery fabric that could, quote, both replace and perfect the known upholstery fabrics made from horsehair weaves, end quote. It could be produced in any variety of width and length and became the foundation of Otti's own independent collection. The Swiss Wohnbedarf AG produced Otti's new fabric. And also the Saxon horsehair weaver in Dresden that usually produced fabrics for the automobile industry and furnished ship cabins, railway passenger cars, offices, quarters and hotels released a collection of Otti's fabric in May of 1937. A second patent Otti Berger obtained for a material called Lamy Plume, a ribbon material made of plant fibers derived from the Rami plant. Originally, it was used to produce gaslight covers, fishnets, canvas, and it was also used in the cable industry. Otti Berger adapted this material to furniture by experimenting with dampening and twisting the rami ribbon before interweaving them, which gave it the stability and durability needed for upholstery fabrics. The results were tension fabrics for tubular steel chairs. Otti Berger gave a new function to the non-elastic ribbon by making it behave like an elastic material and at the same time being extremely tear-resistant. She filed for a patent in 1934 for innovative use of Lamy Plume, which was not accepted until 1937. That's when Otti filed for another application in Britain for the same fabric. This time she was successful and the British patent was issued in March of 1938. Even before this, Berger successfully offered the Lamy Plume to the Swiss Wohnbedarf AG in 1933, and they began selling the fabric in 1934. The fabric was intended to be produced in larger numbers for seating in cinemas, theatres, ballrooms, waiting rooms and office buildings. However, due to reconstructions of the Wohnbedarf AG in early 1935, Ortiz Lamy Plume became one of the company's unfinished projects. There were some more attempts to obtain patents by Otti Berger. You can read all about this in the catalog that Judith Raum produced for the Bauhaus archive. I will mention it uh, later on in this podcast and I will also link you the catalog in the show notes. While Otti Berger was quite successful as a self-employed businesswoman in Berlin and with obtaining patents and thus acknowledgement of her innovative fabrics, things turned sour for her in 1935. That's when Otti Berger was refused membership of the Reichskammer der Künste on account of her Jewish ancestry. And only one year later, in 1936, she was banned completely from working as an artisan. Shortly after, Otti Berger decided to try and make a living in England. She went uh, to England in 1937. She had visited the Gropiuses in February to see if there was a future for her there, eventually a professional future, and uh, then ultimately moved in the summer of 1937, living in uh, different places um, with friends, with Lucia Moholy, with other acquaintances. She only had a few engagements, unfortunately. She worked for a company uh, in Bolton, the industrial producer Helios, at Bolton, that's close to Manchester, where she substituted uh, Marianne Straub, a Swiss textile designer who was also an Emmy Gray and living in um, England. She was not really successful in finding other connections for herself. Part of it was also that she kept being ambivalent about the question if she wanted to be employed or trying to work self-employed. And another part of it was that her focus was on realizing on on succeeding and emigrating to the United States because uh, it, it soon became clear that uh, Walter Gropius, uh, Marcel Breuer, Laszlo Morolinage, all, all her contacts in London moved on to the States. The new Bauhaus was uh, opened in Chicago 
And she also wanted to move on. And also Ludwig Hilbersheimer, her partner, began to make plans to move on to the States. Uh, he was still in Berlin. He considered to come to England for some time. But then as soon as uh, Mies van der Rohe invited him over to become his partner at the Illinois Institute of Technology, it was clear that Ludwig Hilbersheimer's uh, ways would lead him, ultimately bring him to the U.S. So it seems that Otti Berger never really tried 100% to settle in England. And that was the retrospectively the big fault, probably. In 1938, when Ludwig Hilbersheimer had left Germany through England for the United States and arrived in Chicago, the couple still exchanged a few letters uh, Otti Berger trying to find ways to yeah, get a visa, find a way to travel to the States, never succeeded, ultimately left England in, in the summer of 38 because her mother was very sick. Uh, she did not uh, come through Germany anymore. She flew directly over Prague to Croatia and then stayed with her parents from then on, trying to organize her emigration uh, which failed, so she was ultimately deported in the summer of 1944. She got the invitation. We have the formal invitation. Um, you know, uh, the, the problem was that uh, at the time, yeah, it's not clear uh, what the policy was on all sides, on the U.S. side, on the yeah, Yugoslavian side, it was Yugoslavia at the time. Uh, Jews were simply, it was not easy for, for Jews to be let in into the U.S., you needed a lot of money, um, uh, somebody in the U.S. to prove that he or she had a lot of money and to, to give the security that you would not be a burden to the state. And the invitation by Moroli Nash, the offic official invitation was there. Also the offer by Ludwig Hilbersheimer to try to marry her. They, they thought about all kinds of ways uh, entering through Mexico, but nothing worked because in Belgrade she didn't get the uh, visa. She needed the visa. On the other hand, in America, people were missing for an affidavit to give to her, which was this uh, guarantee, this financial guarantee. There was a, a weird coincidence of negative uh, events. You can read all of that in Magdalena Droste's contribution in the publication that I produced now. It's at the end of the book. We have a, a short perspective on her biography, while the main part of the book is con really concentrates on her textile oeuvre. But yeah, Magdalena Droste reviews these, these steps chronologically of this failure of, of the ultimate emigration of Otti Berger, which is very tragic. To me, she seems to have been a character full of humor. Her fabrics are touching and inspiring when you look at them. They are absolutely minimal and reduced, but elegant and fresh, never strict or boring. They are always <laughs> really taking you in somehow, which was for me absolutely seducing and, and the reason for spending several years studying her fabrics. And they forced me, let's say, to, to push for these new weavings, which we realized uh, throughout these years that I dealt with Otti Berger's work. We executed several new weavings of her fabrics um, uh, to show them again at greater sizes, because most of them only survived in these very fragmented small pieces, small dimensions. And uh, when you see them hanging in a space, at full length, three or four meters long, uh, a wall-spanning fabric, three meters high, these delicate and vivid surfaces. I think it's, yeah, it's hard to describe, but when you see it uh, physically stand before the fabric, it's an overwhelming experience. And the energy remains the same. The first encounter in the archives uh, with the small fragments and the encounter in space with the big new weavings in my installation at the Temporary Bauhaus Archive, for example, the impression for me personally is the same. The, the, the vitality of her fabrics is simply timeless. And um, that's what I wanted to enable a larger audience to experience as well. Both uh, publication and exhibition are the result of a, a three year long artistic research process um, that I was involved in. I ex executed a lot of uh, fabric analyses together with the weaver, hand weaver and textile designer Katja Stelz. 
we were we would we traveled to archives worldwide to trace Otibaga's uh, widespread estate and really looked at uh, hundreds of textile samples designed by her and trying to understand their intended function, which is not always clear because the archives are missing information about that because Otibaga died uh, so suddenly. The book, uh, the publication is structured by these functions and that's a, a new contribution, I would say, to the research on Bauhaus fabrics in general. The book really concentrates on her oeuvre in functional fabrics, in fabrics for the application in the interior spaces of uh, the Neues Bauen, and it's structured by these different functions the fabrics take on, such as wall coverings, curtain fabrics, flooring materials, or upholstery fabrics, and looks at these different functions in all kinds of ways, also contextualizing them historically, really explaining the meaning of her contribution to textile design in the 1930s. So it's a, it's a great source of exploration for anybody interested both in architecture, design, art, or craft in general. Today, most of Otti Berger's oeuvre and estate are at the Bauhaus Archive Berlin, the Busch Reisinger Museum Harvard Art Museums, the Museum für Gestaltung in Zurich, the Art Institute of Chicago and at Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester in the UK. Smaller collections are at the Archiv der Moderne in Weimar, the Textile Museum in Tilburg in the Netherlands, at the Bauhaus Dessau Foundation, the Grassi Museum in Leipzig, the Museum for Modern Art in Zagreb, the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Luckily, Otti's English friends made sure she and her work would survive and one day be rediscovered, and in this case by Judith Raum. If you want to know more about Otti Berger's life and her work, go and visit Judith Raum's exhibition Otti Berger, Weaving for Modern Architecture at the Temporary Bauhaus Archive in Berlin. It is still open until 24th of August 2024 or by the accompanying catalogue with the same title, Otti Berger, Weaving for Modernist Architecture, by Judith Raum for the Bauhaus Archive Berlin, which was published by Hartje Kanz. And to be honest, this book is a little pricey with its 50 euros, but it is absolutely worth buying it. And I would even go so far as to say that there should be this kind of book about every Bauhaus person. It is so well researched, written and designed, and on all levels aesthetic and educational. This would be my very personal dream Bauhaus library. I will link you both exhibition and book in the show notes. And last but not least, many, many thanks to Judith Raum for shining light onto Otti Berger and for telling us her story. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast Bauhaus Faces and also to rate it wherever you are listening to the podcast and to recommend it to our fellow Bauhaus fans and researchers. And join me on Instagram at Bauhaus Faces and on my website bauhausfaces.com. If you are part of an institution that wants to fund single episodes about specific Bauhaus persons or my whole podcast, please DM me via Instagram or send an email to bauhausfaces at gmail.com. The next episode of Bauhaus Faces will be about the architect Ari Sharon with one of his grandsons, Ariel Aloni. Sharon studied architecture at the Bauhaus and moved on to become the master planner for the newly founded state of Israel. And now there's nothing else left to say, but tune in next time to Bauhaus Faces.